Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with another MMATakeover.com's interview. My name is Keith Schillen. Today's guest is a true veteran of the sport. He is a 13-year veteran and has 26 wins, 7 losses, 1 draw, and 1 no contest. His no contest was against Alex Oliveira in his last fight. They fight again this Saturday, March 11th at UFC Fight Night 106 in Brazil. This will be his 14th fight in the UFC. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim Means. Tim, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Ah, no, thank you. We appreciate you taking your time and your busy schedule to uh, speak with us. I know all the listeners appreciate it. So the first question we always like to ask everybody is, how did they get into mixed martial arts? You know, along the lines, I was getting bored in school, and, you know, sometimes you get piss fights and win, and I get in some other ones and lose, and... Ultimately, just wanted to learn how to whoop the bully, so um, got me into martial arts and wrestling. So, I opened up a phone book one day and found Tom Allen Bond and fit in HB, and been there ever since. Really? So, you know, that was like twenty years ago, and you guys, you still twenty years later, you've been with the same coach, training mixed martial arts. Yeah, you know, man, I don't. Um, you have ups and downs in life, and I don't find uh, I don't find a reason to have to bail on my team. I find reasons to have to do better myself. So uh, I, I like what I have with Tom and Arlene. You know, they're good in business, and we just have a good thing going. They're family above anything else, so I'll be there for, for, for a very long time. Cool. Um, so you, you mentioned that you were, got picked on. You had bullies in, in grammar school and stuff like that. Does any of those guys still try to pick on you? Uh, no, you know, I, I, we have, uh, one, one guy in particular, I, we run in quite a bit with family functions and stuff like that. And he just, it, yeah, no, it does not happen anymore. <laughs> yeah. He, he kind of hopes that you forget about that or he's going to get punched and eaten in the face. You know, it's, people don't forget those things. They just get bigger, you know? So that's, uh, that's about the extent of that. So uh, one thing about your story that always gets pointed out is that you had a pretty troubled past. Uh, it's no secret. They've talked about it in, in all your UFC fights. You've had – you were shot. You had, were in prison. You had run-ins with uh, drug addictions. Tell us about how that kind of, kind of happened and how mixed martial arts and other factors have helped you uh, turn around your life. Um, you know, I was a kid without responsibilities. What it ultimately came down to, I didn't, I didn't have nothing that I cared about, um, cared about all that much, you know, so I didn't really care for myself or have too much respect for myself or anything of that nature. So, um, came to trouble, came to friends, you know, and then I thought I had good friends or whatever. And when you're younger, you realize the friends come and go, you know, they're like potato chips, you know, you don't have a bag, you'll find a new one every time. So. Um, right now in my life, I can count my good friends on one single hand, you know, and it, uh, martial arts, whenever I got out of prison in 2009 and started back to it, you know, I was, it was something that I was able to make a little bit of money doing, you know, it cost me a couple hundred bucks and I took it. So, um, so, uh, stuck with it and it just helped give me responsibility and give me a new outlook and, uh, a, a, a new view. So I was able to vent my frustrations in the gym. Uh, and then she also went hit a bag and just ultimately became therapy and, and medication in a lot of ways. And, and you know, it, it saved my life. So started out, I was kind of broke or whatever and still, still, still am broke, but things are getting better and I'm able to live a good life and be happy in, in the life I have and have a good solid family and people trust me now and, you know, I'm not that crummy kid no more with a crappy reputation, so um, things are good. Yeah, it's uh, really good to hear that. I mean, you hear these stories of mixed martial yeah. arts. It's turning around so many lives. I know you've heard Matt Brown had a similar story. Uh, Court McGee had a similar story. Um, obviously, all three of you guys have been very successful. Um, all three of you guys in the same weight class. Uh, so one thing I want to mention is is we always joke, we do this show we call Calling a Fight, and we love people's nicknames. We love to get a nickname we have like a nickname hall of fame some of them are like the barn cat uh blia muhammad's nickname remember the name uh your nickname is in our hall of fame our nickname hall of fame the dirty bird how did you get that nickname yeah i wish i had a cool story to go with it but you know i had a bad haircut you know for like right after state and wrestling and then uh i had 
like my one of my first fights in 2003, and a teammate said I looked like a dirty bird, and I hated the nickname. I couldn't stand it. It just stuck, man. And here we are, 15 years down the road or whatever it is, 14 years, and it uh, it's kind of my staple now. So it um, it, it expresses me in a lot of ways, but I hated that damn name, and I actually do look like a dirty bird if you get from the outside looking in. Yeah, no, I I love the nickname. I. But like you said, you didn't. You don't like your nickname. I think that's like a rule. If you like your nickname, it's time for someone to give you a different nickname. You're not. You're not supposed to like your nickname. That's right. Yeah, you got. Uh, for learning about nicknames, it has to be earned. You know, so it has to be given. You can't just pull one out of a hat like the Punisher or some crap. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's got to be given. And yeah, so it was why I didn't like. I guess it's better than the flamingo, but you know, <laughs> there we are. Uh, all right. So when. Uh, when you win, we'll we'll call you the Dirty Bird. But if you get a loss, we'll have to call you the Flamingo then. <laughs> All right. Actually, I, good. I, I'll I'll just make sure I say that from uh, you're in Mountain Time. I'm a lot further away from you, so that's when I'll call you the Flamingo. If anyone near you, then it's definitely the Dirty Bird. <laughs> All right. So yeah, that, that'll work. But I mean, I'd rather be called the Flamingo than the Pitbull because there's like 15 other fighters nicknamed the Pitbull. I mean, you got the whole you got a whole school of Pitbulls in Bellator. You know. So yeah, let's talk. Commonly, commonly used names right there. Yeah. So, uh, so let's talk about your last fight. Um, obviously, it's a very controversial fight. It's a a fight that was ruled a no contest due to illegal knees to a downed opponent. Um, Alex Oliveri opponent has actually appealed uh, the ruling. He's appealing, which he's still waiting on a decision. Are you worried that that might be overturned from a? Actually, let me back up a second. In case anybody hasn't seen the fight, who's listening, uh, you fought Alex Oliveira at UFC 207 in uh, December. It was a very high uh, grappling match. He seemed to came out, tried to really want to grapple with you. Uh, at one point, you were on top. You were landing shots from the top. You kind of there was some space between you. He kind of came up while he was coming up. He was still on one knee. You land two very clean knees to the face. Um, and he can't continue. Um, there was a lot of confusion between Joe Rogan and Mike Goldberg. They had Mark Retner from the Athletic Commission talk. There was confusion with him. Uh, but Dan Murgularga ruled that it was a downed opponent, and he ruled it a no contest. Are you worried that it might be overturned to a disqualification? I care less about that. I think that was in the back of, the head, in the back of his head that I was whooping his ass, and... Uh... You know, it is what it is. I get in the key to get out. Uh, I have been in, I don't know how many rules meetings, never heard it broken down as anything other than your two souls. It was always, if you have a hand down, or if you have a knee down, you have to have a hand down to keep you grounded if you're playing the hand touch game. Yeah. And you, and you eat a knee, it's the person on the ground's fault. And I, Margarito called it a, called it an accidental knee or whatever because he, the way he, he, he broke the rule down himself so it showed a lot of confusion from the ref standpoint from like you said uh the commentators on the side mark ratner other fighters other fans it's just a huge gray area you know and if i was the only one that thought it was a legal knee or saw the gray area in it then i would put the blame on myself but it just showed a great number of people that uh that thought the thought it was legal, you know, and we, I've always been taught it was a three point stance or a three points of contact, and now we know that's a bad analogy of it. You know, it's anything other than your two souls. So, sure, pretty much, I can do a handstand and be considered grounded, which is a stupid ass rule. You know, I think you should be th- be able to throw knees absolutely everywhere, just not soccer kicks. You yeah. know, but um, lesson learned there. You know, I made a mistake, gave all the keys to get out of that fight, but. I know I'm in the back of his head, dude. I think I think his team talked him into this fight, and it's either they're going to get some type of support or whatever emotionally or whatever in front of his home crowd or whatever. But I'm sure he's very nervous. I was starting to thump him pretty good, and um, it's got to be in his head. Yeah, no, you're definitely landing some good shots. Definitely on top, you're landing a lot of elbows, which is definitely something you're known for. Yeah. Um, just just for the record, anybody's listening at home, Dan Margali was actually correct in the ruling. Um, but I agree what you're saying, that if there's a lot of that much confusion, I mean, Joe Rogan was confused, Mike Goldberg was confused, I mean, Mark Retner, who's his job, he had some confusion, and that, I mean, that's his job to know. Um, so hats right. off to Dan Margali, he actually did have it correct, 
He but, did. Yeah, he absolutely, he absolutely did. But and, and I know, obviously, you in the heat of the moment, you were upset by it. But hopefully, this will bring some clarity that they will say, "Hey, we need to really explain this rule. We need to make sure that everyone understands this rule." Um, because I know there was a lot of people coming to your defense. Um, so one question I want to ask you is: You keep saying that you kind of gave him an out. Uh, do you believe that he was truly that hurt that he couldn't continue? At the time, I did. Yes, I thought I thought the knee landed pretty good. The second the second one didn't land; it hit him in the arms. First knee actually skipped off his head pretty good, so I thought that one did hurt him. Yeah, I thought Margarito was stepping in to stop the fight. Okay, and then when I heard the timeout and I turned around. Um, Oliver was laying on his face or whatever, and uh, my coaches were saying he played it off. I didn't think nothing of it too, too, too much. He was playing it off because I went to my media and everything, but afterwards, like 15 minutes, 10 minutes afterwards, we're in the green room eating our food, and I'm trying to find a replay and go, kind of going over in my head, trying to slow it down because, you know, things are so fast in there. And um, He actually stood up after Margarita stepped in. He That's stood right. up, talking about Oliveira, he stood up to protest it. That's and right. he had his hands up protesting and then realized that it was a timeout and then he fell over. Yeah. Started playing off, couldn't walk. But afterwards, we were in the green room and I've had concussions before and, you know, lights hurt my eyes and I have to wear sunglasses and all that because of the This dude comes in the bathroom laughing, high fiving. He's, uh, taking selfies with his team and you know you have any type of real head damage and you're getting carried off on a stretcher like that you're not cracking up afterwards in the back you know you're not laughing joking you know you're worried about yourself and you know your your head's killing you and this dude was perfectly fine and there's no way that he went through that much damage and recovered that quickly and they showed up in the back high-fiving and slapping hands and doing all that shit you know so yeah i do feel he played it off after watching him or reading his body language i think he milked it was realizing that he was getting his ass kicked and tried to take the easy way out and get a good disqualification, and he just didn't get it and wanted to complain and appeal it now. And I haven't heard anything about the appeal. You know, all I've heard is about a rematch. So yeah, no, he they overturned the decision or whatever. That's on him. Yeah, no, he has appealed it, and they're waiting for a decision. Um, hopefully, that won't matter after Saturday. But just for the record, there's a lot of people who believe the same way you did. Um, as soon as you land these, he kind of did jump up. Um, some say he was jumping up saying, hey, that's illegal. Some people were jumping up saying, like, no, don't don't stop the fight. Uh, you know, because a lot of times that happened, guy gets knocked out. He said, hey, that's an early stoppage. Um, I'm not saying that because I'm not a fighter. I'm not going to question a fighter's toughness. I mean, you guys are all, in my opinion, the baddest dudes on the planet. You know, you guys beat the shit out of each other for a living. I mean, that's a very rare breed of people that can, can do that. So I am not questioning that, but there is a lot of people, a lot of people on the internet, a lot of people on Twitter who are saying he was faking. Um, I'm not going to question that, but I obviously don't have any reason to doubt what you're saying either. Um, so let's let's continue with that, talking about that fight. My, my question is to you is, did in the, and I know you only fought for a very brief time, but in that brief time, did he do anything to surprise you? Like, did you expect him to come out trying to grapple you, or did you expect him, I mean, at one point he, he hit a spinning back kick that kind of knocked you down for a second, but did you expect him to come that much into the grappling? Yeah, absolutely. Every, everything he did, my coach had, called it exactly tom tom pinpointed exactly what he would do and you know the only thing i had to do differently is my i didn't have my damn shorts um detail or whatever the word is i didn't have them freaking sized up or whatever so my shorts were a little too big and i was walking forward fixing my pants and he threw that spinning back to okay. fast as shit kind of caught me off balance i fell over and just jumped up right away didn't hurt it just knocked me on my ass or whatever but um I thought I could fix that with just not walking forward with my damn hands down, you know. So those are easy fixes. But my but Coach Tom, he's very good at what he does. He he had him dialed into a T. So that, that's going to be the same fight. It's going to be exactly that. So um, we didn't have enough time to change anything. It's been five weeks or whatever. We haven't had enough time to change anything. So it's going to be the same exact outcome, same exact fight. So what weaknesses do you see in his game that you think you can exploit without obviously giving away your game plan? Mm, man, I'm just coming up to be aggressive. You know, I'm getting in there, gonna get in his head, and he's got to prove to everybody else that he didn't that he didn't fake the situation. He's got to prove to everybody else that you know he was in the fight. So I'm showing up aggressive and just gonna let my hands fly and do the talking. And you know, I dislike Oliveira, so these are the fights I really enjoy. And then I'm in his backyard. I'm back in a corner, and 
You know, you stab you stab a dog or a rottweiler through a fence so many times that dog's gonna get out, bite the shit out of you. And I've just been waiting, man. He's been poking, they've been poking online, saying he's aggravated and poking online with these appeal talks and all that. So uh, I'm ready to let loose. So uh, one thing I want to ask you to do when you get there and you see any of the, anybody from the media there, John Morgan and Kevin Aioli, someone like that, make sure you shoot it and take them down and say, how's my wrestling now? Because I know you were pretty fired up when they said that you couldn't wrestle. Yeah, you know, they had him pinpointed as, uh, they said he was just going to hold me down and beat me up and all that. So I had something to prove with that. He was having a very hard time with getting me down and he was having a very hard time without wrestling me and out scrambling. And he just couldn't keep up with my pace. So, um, all that stuff's got to be in his head. You know, I'm walking in this fight very confident, um, and, and just ready, man. It, uh, it's going to be a violent fight. All right. So one thing you talked about at pace, um, one thing that goes along with pace is obviously weight cutting. That's obviously been a huge issue in MMA. Uh, right now we're talking, it is March 5th, uh, the day after UFC 209. Obviously the big story coming out of UFC 209 was Khabib Norman. Nor- Excuse me, Khabib, Norman Gomadoff not making weight, unable to get to the weigh-ins because of a weight cut. So my question is, if you don't mind me asking, you are five days away from the weigh-ins. Uh, what is your current weight? Oh, I'm 185 right now. Okay, and, and so I got about 14 pounds left. Okay, how much do you cut at the last minute or the last day? I should say. Mm, the last weight cut, I did two pounds the day of. Really? I only had two left the day, day of weigh-ins. I weighed in, yeah, right away. And when do you leave for Brazil? I leave tomorrow. Okay. Is that, is, you know, I'm assuming it's probably, what, a 12-hour plane ride or something like that? Yeah, I think it's like nine. But nine hours, okay. Decent, decent little ride, yeah. Does does that have any effect in, on your weight cut being that, you know, you got pretty much like a half a day where you're not really exercising, you're sitting in a seat on a plane? Um. No, I don't think so. I've really been on my diet and busting ass in my cardio and stuff. And it's not like I'm cutting to 155 no more. I have to make 70. And I've already fought in St. Paul once before. So uh, I, I traveled to Minnesota this past week. We did like a little mock trial to see where I went by. He was going to adapt and all that. And I saw as low as 182, 183 pounds this week, just, just messing around. So um, I'm in really good shape right now. I'm hydrated. I'm ready to just make the cut. Okay. Um, are you worried about a judge's decision being that it's going to be in his home country? Are you worried about anything like that if it goes to a judge's decision that they might lean his way? Because obviously the crowd's going to be on his side. They're going to be cheering for him. They're probably going to be chanting, no, you're yeah. going to die. You know, are you worried about anything yeah, like that? No. no, I already won a decision down in Brazil. So they're pretty they're pretty fair with their decisions, okay. I think. I think their judging's pretty fair down there. So I'm not worried about none of that stuff. Okay. All right. Um, so one thing we always like to do is we always like to ask them, the fighters, to predict the main event. The main event, obviously, is a Brazilian legend, Vitor Belfort. He's fighting against Kelvin Gastelum in a pretty highly contested contest. Uh, do you have a prediction for that fight? Which fight was this? Uh, the, the main event, Vitor Belfort and Kelvin Gastelum. Oh, Gastelum's going to dap up Belfort. Gastelum's a good fighter, man. Good boxing, good defense. He's, he's going to dap up Belfort. All right. Um, I stopped in the second round. Really? Okay. So now, obviously, what's the prediction for your fight? Um, I'm not gonna go, not gonna go with the prediction, man. I'm just gonna show up and I'm gonna be as mean as I can be, and uh, hopefully it lasts longer than three minutes. But if it doesn't, it's not gonna be because it's a no contest. He's going to sleep, and I don't know what round it's gonna be in, but it's gonna be a violent fight. All right. So everyone at home who likes to gamble, I always give out my cornerman picks. Make sure you parlay. According to Tim, parlay him and Kelvin Gastelum, and you'll have a good, good day in in the bank. So let's uh let's talk about uh your future. You win this fight, it'd be your third win in a row. It'd be your seventh out of your last eight fights, all in the UFC one. Uh, bearing a, in in an injury, when would you like to return and against who? You know, man, it's hard. It's hard to call that stuff out. You know, I feel like if I do that, I'm overlooking Oliveira. And just because I dislike Oliveira doesn't mean he isn't dangerous. You know, he's very fast. He's agile. He came in great shape his last fight. So I have to be on my toes, man. Um, I can't. I can't look ahead. I have to take care of him first, and, and then and then discuss that after the fact. Okay. Um, I kind of feel like you were going to say that, but one thing I, I wish we could get to see 
is you versus Donald Cerrone. You guys originally scheduled to fight. Um, there was a you saw the violation that ended up coming back in favor of you. They ruled that you uh, violated a USADA. It comes out that you tested it and it came back to a tainted supplement that wasn't, uh, I guess, labeled correctly. And you were found clean, which is actually a very rare thing to happen. Um, so hats off to you for doing that. Um, is that a fight that you want? You know, you want to get back? Because I know you had a training camp for him and everything. Yeah, yeah, of course I want to fight Cerrone. Cerrone doesn't want to fight me. I've called him out a few times on social media, like when the Robbie Lawler fight happened or whatever, but that dude's avoided me like the plague. Uh, we actually thought he was going to pull out that, that for that fight. You know, he had a car wreck and a bunch of stupid shit was going on. It's not like he was trying to get suspended. And, uh, you know, he's won higher-ranked fights, which I can understand. He doesn't think guys are on his level going into the Masvidal fight, and we've seen how that turned out. Yeah. You know, if you don't watch me fight Masvidal, I thought I won that fight against yeah. Masvidal, so... Uh, my game plan was the same exact game plan that uh, Masvidal had had going in with stuff to take down or stuff the uh, the, the kicks, stay in boxing range and beat his ass up. And um, and again, you know, I, I can't I can't think of I can't think of certain right now. He's on he's on the shelf right now, and, and I, I really just have to take care of of Oliveira before I go anywhere with it. All right, so we appreciate you taking time. We know you're very busy. Obviously, you said you fly out tomorrow, so we're going to let you get going. Uh, my very last question for you, Tim, is have you submitted to the takeover? I'm Tim, the Dirty Bird Means, and I have submitted to the takeover. Uh, Tim, I just want to wish you luck in your fight. I speak on behalf of the entire staff here, and I just want to welcome you to the MMA Takeover family. Oh, yeah, man, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was our interview with Tim Means. Make sure to check out his fight against Alex Oliveira this Saturday on Fox Sports 1. To continue to receive the best MMA coverage around, head over to our website, TheMMATakeover.com. That's TheMMATakeover.com. You can also check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. We appreciate it. Thanks for listening.